Hello, and welcome to the Grunfoss SmartFlow SQE training program. This program has been created for you in response to the huge success of the SQE product line and the constant desire of distributors and dealers to improve their knowledge of this innovative constant pressure product. The program is made up of individual standalone modules which can be viewed in any order and include a smart flow introduction, a system components module, and the diagnostics module. The textbook for this course is the CU301 Installation and Operating Manual, referred to as the INO. This booklet is included in every CU301 carton or can be downloaded from our website at www.grunfoss.com. Please take the time to refer to this book as instructed during the training and you will find it will greatly increase your knowledge and discover it to be a valuable resource for answering almost all of your questions. The students that have taken the 30 minutes or so required to read the entire INO have a great advantage over those that have not. We strongly encourage you to read the entire book. The objective of this training module is to impart an in-depth understanding of the SmartFlow's built-in diagnostics along with simple troubleshooting techniques. We're going to focus on those powerful built-in diagnostics and learn how to read them and interpret them. Both the SQE and the CU301 are by definition computers and each is capable of detecting and declaring a wide range of faults or abnormal operating conditions. The goal of this built-in intelligence is to protect the pump and motor from potential damage and thus extend its lifetime. Similar to the computers built into modern cars, advanced diagnostics can be performed and a record of faults can be viewed. First, a word about what I call the science of troubleshooting. Most of you viewing this are at one time or another called upon to troubleshoot some pumping system. Many are self-taught and learned their troubleshooting skills through long and tedious trial and error, studying sometimes complicated technical manuals, or picking the brains of product application engineers. As with all skills, some people are naturally better at it than others and seem to have a knack for seeing what confounds another. But those talented at troubleshooting all generally have a system they follow for uncovering the subtle secrets of some misbehaving product. There are general techniques that can be learned and applied to any system you are called upon to troubleshoot, whether it's a malfunctioning automobile or a submersible pumping system. In the next few minutes, we'll discuss some of those techniques and the science of troubleshooting. First, let's try to define exactly what troubleshooting is. When asked, many would have replied that it's simply figuring out what's wrong. While true, that definition is a little too vague and doesn't provide any framework or guidance. One of the cleverest troubleshooters of all time was Sherlock Holmes. While Holmes never had to deal with tricky electronic controls or submersible pumping systems, much can be learned from his approach to solving problems. He was forever fond of reminding Dr. Watson that once all the possibilities have been eliminated, whatever remains, no matter how bizarre, must be the truth. Holmes's technique is essentially a process of elimination made by careful observation. That is the essence of good troubleshooting. I'd like to share with you three general rules to follow which can help add some structure to your troubleshooting technique. Rule number one, be like Sherlock Holmes and follow a systematic and efficient process of elimination. The process of elimination in itself can be tedious and time consuming. Therefore, it must be systematic and efficient as well. It's important to identify possible causes of a problem and then ask questions or make measurements in such an order that you eliminate the highest number of them with each answer. For example, if you have a pump that won't run, you know that it could be caused by no power, a failed pressure switch, a broken wire, a locked pump, or maybe a faulty motor. In this example, to systematically eliminate the most possibilities, one approach would be to measure motor winding resistance starting at the breaker panel after disconnecting the leads from power and activating the pressure switch. This would test all at once the motor integrity, the wiring continuity, and the pressure switch. The concept is summarized by identifying all the possible causes of a problem and then systematically performing tests which eliminate the maximum number of possibilities. Using this common sense technique, you can solve problems much more efficiently, saving a lot of time and frustration. Rule number two, never replace something unless you can explain why. No one would argue with this one, as most agree it's plain common sense. 
but sadly, this is one of the most common techniques employed in the field. Service engineers at our company regularly received calls from installers that responded to a trouble call and began immediately swapping out elements of the system without regard as to why. It's not uncommon that they will replace the entire system and still not solve the problem. While this is technically a process of elimination, it's only randomly systematic and highly inefficient. See rule number one. Randomly replacing system components can be an expensive, time-consuming, and frustrating way of solving problems. Make sure you don't waste your time replacing components unless you can explain how you know they are defective. Rule number three, identify and use all available tools to eliminate possibilities. These days, many systems come with built-in diagnostics, which assist in eliminating many of the possible causes of problems. The smart flow system is equipped with sophisticated built-in diagnostics indicated by various LEDs or by the use of the R100, a handheld diagnostic device. These aids will not only eliminate possibilities, but narrow the focus as to what the problem truly is. For example, if the system declares a dry run alarm, then it has eliminated for you the possibilities of a faulty pressure sensor, faulty pump or motor wiring, improper power, and many more, allowing you to zero in on the true problem with a minimum of wasted time. Let's begin our study by discussing the types of alarms the smart flow can declare and what they mean. Note on the front panel the red serviceman LED. If this light comes on, it indicates a problem that generally means the system cannot produce water. It's then up to the serviceman to begin the process of elimination to determine why. Also located on the front panel is the alarm indicator for dry run. If this LED is lit, the SQE has determined that the well has been pumped dry and is shut down to protect the pump end. By default, this alarm automatically clears itself after five minutes and tries to return to normal operation. If the well has recovered or demand has ended, the alarm will be transient and unless someone observed this alarm LED, no one will know what caused the temporary shutdown. That is, unless you have the R100 handheld diagnostic tool, which displays a history of alarm events. We'll discuss this tool in detail shortly. If the alarm is not a dry run, the next step in troubleshooting is to remove the front cover and observe the internal diagnostic LEDs. Please open your INO to page 12. The first thing you want to note is the status of the three green power supply LEDs identified by arrows 2, 3, and 4. The electronics require a plus 24 volt DC, a plus 10 volt DC, and a plus 5 volt DC to operate properly. And if any of these three LEDs is not green while power is present, the CU301 has failed and must be replaced. If this type of failure is found after a lightning storm or power grid problem, it's recommended that a surge suppressor or lightning arrestor be installed. Note the three solid green LEDs near the center of the circuit board. Remember, these must be on for normal operation. In the lower right hand corner of the circuit board, there are 13 LED status and alarm indicators that are defined on page 12 of the INO. Let's discuss them one at a time. The top one, labeled control indicator, flashes green to indicate normal operation. Think of the flashing green LED as a heartbeat, indicating all is well. If it's not flashing while power is applied, the CU301 has failed and must be replaced. Note the flashing control indicator LED. This is what a normally functioning CU301 looks like. At a glance, it can be seen that there are no alarms present, the control indicator is properly flashing, and the three power supply LEDs are lit. If you're troubleshooting a system and see this picture, don't replace the CU301. It's functioning normally. Next is the sensor defective LED. If this red LED is on, it indicates that the signal coming from the pressure sensor is invalid. The sensor outputs a small current between 4 and 20 milliamps, and if the CE301 does not detect this current, the alarm will be declared. A sensor defect alarm does not reset itself until the problem is repaired. 
However, the presence of this alarm does not automatically mean the sensor has failed. First, make sure the sensor cable is properly attached to the CU-301 and then no wires or splices have broken. The pressure sensors are very reliable and rarely fail, so please remember troubleshooting rule number two. Never replace something without knowing why. If there's no sensor alarm present, but you want to verify proper operation of the pressure sensor, you can do it with the R100, which we'll discuss shortly, or you can do it with the multimeter. Please turn to page 28 of the INO. There you will find instructions for measuring the DC voltage on the sensor terminal in the CU301 and a chart for converting that voltage to pressure. By measuring the voltage and referring to this chart, you can compare the reading with a pressure gauge and determine if the sensor is sending out the correct pressure signal. Simply follow the instructions found on page 28. The overload and over temperature alarm LEDs will come on if the motor is overloaded or if the internal temperature rises above safe levels. An overload means the motor has drawn more current than is allowed and will shut the pump down for five minutes before trying to restart. It could indicate that the pump is blocked and cannot spin. If sand is a problem in the well, it could possibly generate overloads. Even though the SQE contains a built-in check valve, it's always good practice to install an additional one in the drop pipe, similar to a conventional pump. The trip points for these alarms are set at the factory and defined in the INO. Please turn to page 26. The factory settings table is organized into several columns, the first few showing the 230 volt models and the last column the 115 volt models. Press the pause button here and take a moment to review the information in this table. The speed reduction LED is always used in combination with either the overload or the voltage alarm LED. If conditions causing either of these alarms is not severe enough to stop the pump, it will continue operating in speed reduction mode. The object is to allow the pump to continue operating in order to produce some water although at a reduced performance level. The factory settings chart on page 26 of the INO defines the voltages the speed reduction will kick in. The voltage alarm will light and stop the pump if input voltage is outside the allowable limits as shown in the factory settings chart. This alarm will automatically clear itself when voltage levels return to within normal limits. Finally, the no contact alarm LED. If this is lit, it indicates that the power line communication between the CU301 and the SQE has either been lost or corrupted. There are a number of things that could cause this, so it's best to start eliminating the easiest ones first. If there's been a break in either of the two wires going to the SQE, this alarm will occur. Check to make sure they are intact. A simple way is to press and hold the on button for more than five seconds as described on page 9 of the INO. This will force the motor to run at full speed while the button is being pressed. If the motor runs, then the wires are probably okay. Be careful though, running the pump at full speed could cause high pressures. If multiple CU301s are installed, cross communication between them could cause the no contact alarm. Please pause here and turn to page 5 of the INO and read the precautions described in section 1.2. Another possible cause of this alarm could be that the circuitry in either the CU301 or the SQE that handles the power line communication may have failed. The easiest way to eliminate which one it is is to replace the CU301 first and see if that clears the alarm. If not, then the SQE may need replacing. Keep in mind that if the R100 has been used to change the ID number of the system, any replaced components must also be set to the assigned number. For more detailed information on this subject, please refer to section 5.3.9 of the INO. Here's an example of a no contact alarm. 
Note that the no contact LED in the lower right hand corner is lit. Also note that the front panel red serviceman LED will be on. At the front end of an SQE motor, the input circuitry is constructed of solid state semiconductors. As a result, ohm meters cannot be used to measure motor winding resistance as is done with conventional motors. Ohming the input wires of an SQE motor will show infinite resistance, or what appears to be an open winding, when actually the motor may be fine. Additionally, high voltage insulation testers like mega ohm or high pot testers will falsely indicate a short to ground. At the front end of an SQE motor, the input circuitry includes surge suppression devices. When high voltage is applied to these devices, it conducts, shorting the mega ohm or high pot testers to ground. Again, these tests will falsely indicate a short to ground when actually the motor may be fine. The only standard test equipment that can be used are amp probes and voltmeters. The best tools for troubleshooting the system are the ones designed specifically for that purpose. Use of the handheld R100 provides the most information and highest levels of troubleshooting capabilities. If that's not available, the internal diagnostic LEDs reviewed earlier are your best tool. One simple way to troubleshoot the SQE that has quit working or keeps going into overload is to remove the cable guard and examine the area where the wires enter the unit. Whatever collects in this pocket is what has been going through the pump. This photo shows an SQE that pumped a lot of sand. The R100 has the ability to provide advanced diagnostics and system performance information related to the smart flow system. Some of that information includes alarm type and alarm history, pressure sensor diagnostics, motor temperature, speed, and power consumption, and the number of starts and hours of operation. Additionally, the R100 can be used for advanced configuration. It provides capabilities that allow changing built-in parameters like maximum motor speed, alarm reset times, and maximum pressure setting, to name a few. The R100 is really very simple to use. Those that spend just a few minutes learning how to use it find that they can save themselves hours of wasted time and frustration if they ever encounter a system problem. Remember rule number three from our troubleshooting discussion. Identify and use all available tools to help eliminate possibilities. The R100 can help eliminate many false leads and identify system problems, allowing you to focus on the correct solutions. The R100 uses infrared, just like your TV remote, to communicate with the CU301. To turn it on, press the OK button once and you'll see the Grunfuss logo. Press the OK button once more, which will take you to the Start menu. To begin, just point it at the CE301 front panel between the up and down arrows, then press and release the OK button. It needs to be held within a few inches of the CE301 to operate. When the R100 is communicating with the CE301, the red LED shown circled will begin flashing. Continue to hold the R100 in place until the flashing ends. At that point, you can now begin navigating through the various menu screens to review the information you have just captured. If you have the front panel off and want to use the R100, point it at the shiny black component as shown in the photo. Please turn to page 14 of the INO for a map of all the screens that can be viewed with the R100. Please take the time to read the details about each screen in the pages that follow. Note that the display of screens is organized in rows and columns. Each column is named. The first two columns on the left are for optional configuration of the R100, and their functions can be reviewed in the R100 manual. The columns specific to the CU301 are column number one, operation, column number two, status, and column three, installation. This is a map of where the screens reside in the R100, and to navigate, you simply use the up and down, left and right arrow buttons on the front of the R100. To aid in navigation, 
the column you are in is always displayed at the bottom of the screen. Now let's review. To start the R100, press the OK button and you'll see the Grundfos logo. Press it again and you'll be taken to the Start menu. Now aim the R100 at the CU301 and press the OK button. Note the flashing red LED on the CU301 front panel. Now that you have taken a snapshot of the data, you can begin reviewing it by using the up and down and the left and right navigation keys to move around the row and column structure of the various screens. To turn off the R100, simultaneously press the left and right arrow keys. The flashing red LED near the on-off button is your visual indication that the R100 is communicating with the CU301. One of the more useful screens found in the status column is the actual pressure as reported by the pressure sensor. This is the best way to troubleshoot the sensor as you can read exactly what pressure it is sending. Using the R100, it takes about five seconds to verify if the sensor is working properly. We hear time and again of servicemen replacing the pressure sensor at the first sign of problems, only to find that the problem didn't go away and that they wasted their time. Remember rule number two in our earlier troubleshooting discussion. Never replace something unless you can explain why. Another powerful feature of the R100 is the ability to review a history of the last five alarms that occurred. Remember that most alarms automatically reset themselves, and without the R100, unless you were there when it occurred, there's no way of knowing what alarms were experienced. A good example of this is the dry run alarm. More than once we've heard the story of an SQE installer responding to a service call in which the customer complained that every once in a while he'd be taking a shower and the water would suddenly stop. A little later, it would start back up. When the serviceman arrived, the system was working normally and there were no alarms indicated. But with the R100, he was able to determine the dry run alarms had been occurring and shutting down the system to allow the well to recover. Without the R100, he would have only been able to guess. We believe that this capability creates a higher level of customer confidence and adds a certain level of professionalism to those companies that use the R100. The SmartFlow system can even help you troubleshoot the plumbing system by displaying another useful piece of information, the number of hours the pump is operated and the number of times it is started. If either of these numbers seems excessive, it could indicate a leak in the plumbing. For example, let's say the system has been installed for only a week and it's discovered that the pump has started a thousand times. That would seem very excessive and indicate either a leak or a problem with the diaphragm tank. We've heard repeated instances where servicemen have discovered leaking pipes based on this information found in the R100. For those interested in energy consumption, the R100 will display the present amount of power the SQE is using, as well as the accumulated number of kilowatt hours the pump has consumed over its lifetime. Due to its highly efficient design and the fact that it uses only as much energy as required, the SQE typically consumes far less power than a normal hair dryer. In addition to being able to read information from the CU301, the R100 can be used to change various factory settings controlling the operation of the system. Details of which parameters can be changed are spelled out in the INO. Let's review how to make those changes and for our example, we'll show how to lock out the maximum pressure set point that can be chosen. Many installers use this feature to prevent unauthorized changes to the pressure set point. Start the R100 up by pressing the OK button once, which will display the Grundfos logo. Press it once more, go to the Start screen, and then point and press the OK button. Now referring to the menu map on page 14, use the arrow keys to navigate to the maximum pressure setting screen found in the installation column. Looking closer, this is what you will see. Starting from the operation column, press the right arrow twice to move into the installation column. Then press the down arrow twice to move to the maximum pressure setting screen. The factory setting of 100 PSI is shown. To change this setting, use the plus and minus keys to select a new value. In this case, we'll limit the max set point to 80 PSI. Now aim at the CU301 and press OK. If you successfully made the change, the new setting will appear as shown with white characters in a blue background. 
Now the maximum set point cannot be set above this new value. Another great troubleshooting resource can be found starting on page 22 of the INO. Please pause the video and turn to those pages. Take a few minutes familiarizing yourself with the troubleshooting guide. Now turn to page 25 and pause the video to review the information contained in the technical data section. Let's take a few minutes now and practice some of our new troubleshooting skills. The following exercises will help illustrate some of the techniques we've learned. Let's say you're the serviceman and have just arrived at a customer's house who has complained the pump doesn't run. You open a kitchen faucet and verify that no water is being produced. What's next? Recall our three rules for troubleshooting. Rule number one is to follow a systematic and efficient process of elimination. Rule number two is never replace something unless you can explain why. And rule number three, identify and use all available tools to eliminate possibilities. Let's start with rule number three and identify an available tool to help us, the CU301 INO. Turn to page 22 and refer to fault number two in the troubleshooting guide found there. It will help us follow rule number one and get us started on a systematic and efficient process of elimination. Referring to the guide, it indicates that the problem could be caused by the CU301, the pressure sensor, or the pump itself. The systematic steps described in the remedy column will help us eliminate possibilities until only one is left. Follow these steps in order and you will solve the problem in the minimum amount of time. Resist the urge to violate rule number two by randomly changing out components without evidence they have failed. A significant portion of our warranty returns, when evaluated, show no failure found. Let's try another. Say you're the serviceman and have just arrived at a customer's house who has complained that the pump runs continuously with no demand. You verify that the front panel green LEDs indicate that the pump is indeed running while all faucets and valves are closed, and note that the set point is set at 70 PSI. You observe the pressure gauge and note that it's correctly showing 70 PSI. Again, let's turn to page 22 and refer to fault number 4 in the troubleshooting guide. The first possible cause listed is the pump cannot deliver set pressure. Well, in this case, it seems that the pump is indeed delivering the set pressure of 70 PSI. But looking closer at the CU301, you notice that the max speed LED is lit, telling us that the pump is running at its maximum speed. Recall from our discussion in the System Components module that before shutting off, the SQE is designed to precharge the pressure to 7 PSI above set point. From our observations, we can conclude that the pump running at maximum speed is incapable of reaching set point plus 7 and therefore cannot shut off. The pump is either undersized for the application or the required head has changed. To test this theory as described in the troubleshooting guide, simply lower the set point and see if the pump shuts off. Let's spend a few minutes learning how to properly size an SQ or an SQE pump. With conventional pumps, many will make their selection based on desired flow and horsepower. But the smart flow products are more easily sized by selecting desired flow and desired head. Following two simple steps and referring to the chart on page 7 of the INO, the proper model can be easily determined. Step 1 is to calculate the maximum head required at desired flow. To do that, you need to determine four things and then add them all together. First, determine the dynamic head the pump needs to provide. Dynamic head is simply the maximum number of feet the pump will ever lift water to the top of the well. In order to avoid undersizing, it's important to know the maximum pumping level. Next, add in the desired set point pressure in units of feet. Multiply PSI times 2.31 to 
to convert to feet. For example, 60 psi times 2.31 equals 139 feet. Believe it or not, all pipes create a small resistance, or friction, to flowing water, and in some cases this can add up to significant head losses. Generally speaking, the smaller the diameter, the greater the friction loss. Direction changes like elbows and 45 degree bends produce even greater losses. Referring to published charts found in the Grunfoss Pocket Sizing Guide, or the Engineering Manual, add up the friction loss from all piping, including drop pipe, straight runs, and elbows. Finally, determine the above grade elevation from the wellhead to the highest pumping point. Add all these together and you'll have your maximum head required. For example, let's say you had a dynamic head of 80 feet, a desired set point of 60 psi, which is equal to 139 feet, a total friction loss of 10 feet, and a 20-foot elevation lift. Adding these all together gives a max head required of 249 feet. For step 2, refer to the sizing chart found on page 7 of the INO and choose a model based on the desired flow rate and the calculated head from step 1. In our example, let's say the customer needs only 5 gallons per minute, and the head we calculated was 249 feet. Choose from the chart a model from the 5 SQE family of pumps with a max head rating greater than our calculated max head of 249 feet. Based on that criteria, the 5 SQE 230 would be the best choice for our example application. This concludes the System Diagnostics module. We hope it's been instructive and worthwhile and encourage you to view the other two modules in this set of instructional videos. Thank you for your attention and your continued support.